So a couple decades ago, um, a couple very simple experiments took place that shrunk everything that the world scientific community thought they understood about the laws of nature and the laws of physics into a little less than 4% of the entire energy content of the universe. The rest of it, we call the stuff called dark matter, and dark matter is almost like the, the glue that holds the universe together. You can almost imagine it like a, a frisbee. If I dribble some peanuts onto a frisbee and I, fr I spin the frisbee around, you expect to see some of the peanuts on the edge of the frisbee go flying off, and maybe some of the peanuts in the middle will stick right where they are. And we expect to see that when we look at galaxies at night. As these galaxies are busy rotating, we expect to see the stars on the edge of the galaxies go flying off. But they don't. It's almost as if someone got some super glue and stuck my peanuts onto the frisbee. The rest of the stuff, dark energy, constitutes about 75% of the total energy of the universe. And this is really almost like, a, like an anti-gravity. And around about this time, uh, I was busy trying to forge my way into a career as a jazz musician. Um, actually, the original photo I had up here was of me with significantly longer hair, but uh, no one said, everyone said they didn't know who it was. So I put this one with a couple of other more well-known musicians on that picture. And around about this time, I got a telephone call to say, listen, by the way, the World Scientific Community has proposed to build one of the most technologically advanced scientific facilities to ever be built in history. This is called the SKA, or Square Kilometer Array. Now, the whole thing about building a telescope and building a radio telescope, which is what this is, is the bigger the better. Because what you really are doing when you build a telescope is you're building a time machine. And put it quite simply, Imagine when you see the sun set. Now, we know light takes eight minutes to reach us from the sun. So, in fact, whenever you see a sunset, the sun actually set eight minutes ago, and you're only seeing the light from it reach us now. Now, if you build a very big telescope, the very big telescope, then the bigger the better, because the bigger it is, the more sensitive it is, and the more sensitive it is, the weaker the signals it can detect. And those weak signals have been traveling through the universe for hundreds of millions, or if not billions of years. And what we hope to do with something like the SKA is to receive these signals and try to create a whole timeline or a, a, an animation of the universe when the very first stars began to form and the first galaxies began to form. And perhaps <laughs> discover things like, uh, I don't know, television signals from alien soap operas from the other side of the universe. Now this is a completely futuristic instrument. It's going to require a supercomputer that is 100 times more powerful than any supercomputer that exists today. It's called an exaflop machine. The amount of data that this instrument is producing is something like 15 million 64 gigabyte iPods every day. It produces, the amount of data it produces, something like 10 to 100 times more than the global internet traffic. This is a beast of a machine. Oh, come on. Can I go forward? So the question is why? <laughs> and more pertinently, why would a country like South Africa, in deepest, darkest Africa, have the audacity to submit a bid proposal to the world's international scientific community to host what will be the most technologically advanced scientific facility in history? I guess this is the world's perception or the world's view of Africa. Now, there's some good things and there's some bad things. But let's take an example. Let, let's look at the Soccer World Cup. Now, I guess no one would really argue that you know, hosting the Soccer World Cup was a bad thing for South Africa. I mean, what did we do? We, we, we changed the world's perception about Africa and, and really marketed South Africa as a great safari destination. We, we showed the world that we could build some soccer stadiums. And we also proved to the world that we could host a, an international sporting event for six weeks. 
$2 billion is how much it cost, something like that. Now, let's look at the World Cup of Science. Yeah, comparatively, something like $2 billion, but it won't be South African $2 billion. It'll be $2 billion coming from the rest of the world. It will operate for something like 50 years, so a lot longer than six weeks. And what it will do is it will change the world's perception about South Africa and Africa as a viable destination for investment in technology and engineering and intellectual property. Because really what we want to try to do is change Africa into one that is competitive and participates in the global knowledge economy. And perhaps, you know, as a, a, a former TED winner, um, let the next Einstein come from Africa. Why? Why would the world want to build such an important scientific facility that has the potential to answer many of the questions that are faced by the scientific community today? Why would they want to put it in Africa? And I guess, well, <laughs> there's some unique advantages about Africa in building something like a telescope. And I guess as, a, as a, any real estate agent would tell you, it's all about location, location, location. And in fact, that SKA is, is going to be distributed not just in South Africa, but in eight African partner countries. And as many of you would have experienced, you know, the global increase in connectivity of Africa to the rest of the world as all the undersea cables start connecting us to the rest of the world, um, certainly allows us to operate something like this huge facility and distribute all the data to the rest of the world's scientific community. Now, one of the best places to build a telescope or a radio telescope is, in fact, on the dark side of the moon. Okay? You've got no people running around with Wi-Fi networks and cell phones and things like that. I guess one of the disadvantages is you end up having to put all of your money into building a space shuttle to get to the moon. Likewise, one of the cheapest places to build a telescope is in the middle of somewhere like Johannesburg. You've got all the power, you've got all the data. But the problem is you've got people running around with cell phones and television transmitters, so you won't be able to use it. And so really, you've got to look for a compromise. And well, this is a population density map of South Africa. And you can see this high population density in areas like Johannesburg and, and, and Pretoria. Um, and it's almost as if when the, provincial, when the government drew up the borders for the new, provin for the new provinces, um, they kind of drew a black line around where everyone lived and called the rest the Northern Cape. <laughs> <laughs> So less than 2% of South Africa's population actually live within the Northern Cape, which is 43% of the total surface area of the country. Most of them live in Kimberley or Uppington. So a great place to build a radio telescope. And probably one of the most important questions, the question that everyone asks, not just the world scientific community, but everyone around the world, and people in South Africa as well, does South Africa really have the competence, the expertise, the skills to actually not just host something like the SKA, but design and build it? Back in 2005, we established a team which knew nothing about astronomy. What it was, was a bunch of excited, exuberant, skilled engineers and scientists we decided that they were going to learn everything that the world knew about astronomy and then improve on everything that the world knew. We've succeeded in uh, establishing a human capital development program which produces PhDs in science and engineering at a rapid rate, which are well, respected around the world. Um, in fact, we just had the director from one of the US National Radio Astronomy Observatories in South Africa who said that, well, the South African team is probably one of the best teams he's ever seen. We developed technology which is started off as a, as a minor, well, a major research program in the University of California at Berkeley. Um, it's effectively now being driven by our team in Cape Town and is used in a large number of countries around the world. We are not only preparing to host something like the SKA, but we're actually developing most of the technology. The Meerkat telescope is a precursor instrument to the SKA, 
and it really is setting the pace towards development of technology, not just for radio astronomy facilities, not just for scientific facilities, but really pushing the edge of things like supercomputing and the next generation of technology that our society will reap the rewards of, not next year, not in two years' time, not in even five years' time, but in 10 or 20 years' time. I guess one of the most startling things I find about the SKA, and why I'm still employed in the project eight years later, is that South Africa does have the talent. We've got the expertise. We just need a good problem for these people to work on, Otherwise, they're going to find some other problems elsewhere to go work on. It's possible. Thank you.